Welcome to Outlook, I'm Suzanne Higgins. In November, 12 talented West Virginia artists were inducted into the West Virginia Music Hall of Fame. From country to opera, from jazz to polka music, it was a very special evening at the Cultural Center. These artists have traveled the world with their music, reaching peaks in their profession. We'll hear from all the attending artists and several family members. The 2008 West Virginia Music Hall of Fame induction ceremony welcomed a dozen new members, beginning with the Lilly Brothers and Don Stover. The Lilly Brothers and Don Stover were neighbors as boys growing up in Clear Creek in Raleigh County. They're credited with bringing Southern Appalachian music to the upper northeastern region of the U.S. and to as far away as Japan. Their music is often called bluegrass, but 85-year-old Everett Lilly has another name for it. American folk mountain country music. It's related to country music and it's certainly related to folk music. It's telling about somebody's life. They was good or bad, they were even having a hard time or a good time. So we singing about that, and we put our heart and soul in it, and the people could feel it. Everett and his older brother, Michael Burt, known as B, started their duet professionally in the 1930s on local radio and the Wheeling Jamboree. You and B, your voices, what is it about that, you know, family blending of, of voices? Man, B could just go out on the stage, not know what we was going to do, and we'd start on the same song. That's amazing. Yes, it is. It's just something you feel from one to another, you know, if you're family. Tie up those broken cords and let us be lovers again. Do you consider yourself a musician first who sings, or are you a singer who plays multiple instruments, or is it all just one? Well, I think you have to learn the instrument first. And you add your voice to that. But your voice has a craving for that, see? When you pick up the instrument, naturally you're going to try to fit it to your voice. Don Stover joined the Lilly Brothers in the 1950s. They then accepted an invitation to Boston, where fans were so enthusiastic about their music, the band stayed for 18 years. They played seven nights a week, 50 weeks a year. The Lilly Brothers and Don Stover are also members of the International Bluegrass Music Hall of Fame and the Massachusetts Country Music Hall of Fame. Stover passed away in 1996, B in 2005. When he can, Everett continues to perform with his sons in their band, the Lily Mountaineers. You might call it the new band. Yeah. It's just new generation getting in too, you know. Everett Lilly and the Lily Mountaineers just won the 2008 International Bluegrass Music Association Recorded Event of the Year. In the 1940s, Ann Baker became known as Charleston's First Lady of Jazz. When we saw that movie Rhythm of the Rift, she never even mentioned it. And we were like, oh my goodness, Ann, look what you did. I said, you made a music video before video. I found two eyes, they were just a little bit bluer. Talented and sexy, Ann Baker from Washington, Pennsylvania, was on her way up in the 1940s, singing with the bands of Louis Armstrong, Lionel Hampton, and Count Basie. I love my she replaced Sarah Vaughn in Billy Eckstein's band, a lineup that included Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Dexter Gordon, and Miles Davis. Then a stop in Charleston, West Virginia, and the meeting of a local nightclub owner changed the course of that career. She fell in love with Delaney Wagner, Wag, and she wouldn't leave when the band got ready to go. She wouldn't leave, and she stayed here for the rest of her life, and she just 
loved it. She loved West Virginia. There may be other songs to sing. And she ball, never had and any regrets about, oh, what could have been, should have been, or anything like that, because West Virginia made her a star in her own right. All the music of life seems to be. Ann Baker continued like to pack a crowd singing in Charleston singing nightclubs and local jazz festivals. In the daytime, she'd be walking her dogs in her cutoffs or whatever, and then at night she'd have an evening gown on and be a diva. That was just her, just Miss Ann. My cold man, he's an old man. Almost 62. Child, I'm here to tell you, that man sure knows what to do. Some of those songs are really racing. Yes, they are. <laughs> Especially that one where Anna Baker's been here and gone. Tell them it was little Ann Baker. But she's been here and gone. Ann Baker performed into her 80s and died of throat cancer in 1999. Her family says Baker insisted on being buried in her adopted home state. Miss Ann Baker, ladies and gentlemen. A faithful hero of Dishon. Phyllis Curtin was born in Clarksburg in 1921, and today she's considered one of the finest performers in American opera history. Curtin played all the major soprano roles and performed on the world's most prestigious stages. And here are the soloists, Phyllis Curtin, soprano. In the 1950s, Curtin starred in a wide range of productions, including Wuthering Heights, Strauss's Zalame, and Carlisle Floyd's opera, Susanna. Consider the criteria for success in this field. One must have the ability to fill large opera houses with your voice completely unamplified and remember the presence of a symphony orchestra as well. As an actor, one must bring life and believability to characters in a genre whose plots and characters are often quite unbelievable. One must study and practice to assimilate a great musical tradition that lasts over the past several centuries but you also imbue that with your own personality and style. Benedictus, Benedictus. Phyllis Curtin performed into her 60s and has since taught at Yale and Boston universities and the Beijing and Moscow conservatories. Not well enough to travel to West Virginia, Curtin sent a video thank you from her home in Boston. I've been an ardent West Virginian all my life, from the time I was three taking walk in the hills with my father to winter picnics with my mother when we'd be in the snow looking for ground pine, in the spring looking for yellow violets and hepatica, West Virginia's it. I had a long and happy career and it took me all over the world singing recitals in opera houses with symphony orchestras. Along the way, a lot of honors came my way and that was lovely, but nothing is like this one. This one is unique. It is from my native turf. I can't tell you what joy it is to me to think that I am chosen for a bit of happy notice by my parent state. No accolade can carry anything as precious as that. And I thank you with all my heart. like Blue Skirt Waltz, In Heaven There Is No Beer, and Beer Barrel Polka established Frankie Yankovic of Davis, West Virginia as America's polka king in the 1940s. You probably can't go to a wedding, no matter what nationality it is, that they don't play probably one of his songs. Just because you think you're so pretty, just because you think you're so hot, Yankovic was born in Tucker County in 1915 and became the first to score a million-selling polka single with the song Just Because and the first to win a Grammy for Best Polka Album. What was so amazing is that whenever anyone asked him where he was from, he would always say West Virginia, and yet he was only here for a couple months. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's different stories. I have heard he was eight days old. I've heard he was a few months old. But 
it didn't matter to him. This is where his parents met. This is where his parents had his three sisters and him. Actually, the only reason they left was because my grandfather was doing a little bootlegging at the time. So he needed to get out of town and pretty fast. The family moved to Cleveland, where Frankie fell in love with the music heard in the home of his Slovenian parents. That's when he picked up the accordion. He fell in love with the expressions and the way people felt when they heard the polka music. So he, he took that through his whole life, and that to him was what he loved most about entertaining, was seeing the people being so happy. Frankie Yankovic and the Yanks toured into the 1980s, 330 days a year at their peak. Here they entertained a crowd at the West Virginia Cultural Center. Even while on the road to his next performance, Yankovic made a point of answering the correspondence of every fan. And he would have the typewriter, the old-fashioned typewriter, on his lap. And he would be sitting there with two fingers typing thank you notes and saying hello, whatever it was, because he believed in answering every single person. Frankie Yankovic died in 1998. His nephew, Bob Kravis, performed at his induction. My father said, it's the happiest music this side of heaven, and it's true. Cooper is a quintessential, no holds barred, reared back Appalachian singer. It's a very soulful singing style and soul piercing, particularly Wimbledon's gospel repertoire. It just, it really drips with emotion. I mean, it just is so penetrating. This old house is getting shaky. This old house is getting old. This old house that's in the rain. This old house that's in the cold. Wilma Lee Cooper was born in 1921 in Valleyhead in Randolph County and grew up performing with her parents and sisters in the regionally popular Leary Family Gospel Group. We sung in every church in Elkins that was near our home. Everything but the Catholic church we didn't sing it at. Cooper continues to recuperate from a stroke in 2001, but the 87-year-old remains passionate about her music. For being such a petite woman, you had a powerful, powerful voice, didn't you? Yes, I was blessed with a strong voice. Make me that special, shine the light on me. Wilma Lee married the gospel group's fiddler, Dale Stoney Cooper, in 1939. Together they formed their own group, the Clinch Mountain Clan, performing a mix of country, bluegrass, and mountain music. The Coopers were a mainstay for a decade on the Wheeling Jamboree and the Grand Old Opry, and established themselves as one of country music's most popular duos. Talk to us about performing at the Grand Old Opry. It's a top country show in the country. We were working at WRVA Richmond, Virginia. They booked a lot of the Grand Ole Opry talent. When they did, they always wanted that summer sort of show. In 1974, the Smithsonian Institution honored Wilma Lee Cooper as the first lady of bluegrass. Stoney Cooper died in 1977, but Wilma Lee continued to perform until 2001. My heart is jumping, you should start something with them, their eyes. They sparkle, they bubble, they're going to get you in a whole lot of trouble, well look out. Them Their Eyes, made popular by Billie Holiday and sung here by Ann Baker, was written by Maceo Pinkard of Bluefield. 
Born in 1897, Pinkard graduated from Bluefield Colored Institute in his hometown in 1914. Well, let me tell you, well, no chick mate could be the same as sweet Georgia Brown. A decade later, Pinkard co-wrote Sweet Georgia Brown, a familiar tune on basketball courts around the world. We've carried the song Sweet Georgia Brown everywhere, every nook, every little cranny, every little hole in the world. People will leave our games humming Sweet Georgia Brown. With no family available to attend the ceremony, Harlem Globetrotter Meadowlark Lemon accepted the West Virginia Music Hall of Fame Award in Maceo Pinkard's honor. Lemon says Sweet Georgia Brown conveys the joy exhibited by the Globetrotters. Joy is a spirit that comes from within. And that's what we wanted to carry around the world. And that's what we did. We were called ambassadors of goodwill in short pants through all types of times, troubled times, good times, bad times. My heart's jumping to show us on something with Pinkard also ran a theatrical agency, toured with his own orchestra, and wrote the 1922 all-black review, Liza. Pinkard became the first African-American to own a music publishing business and is a member of the Songwriters Hall of Fame. Maceo Pinkard died in 1962. Jazz musician and film and television composer Robert Drasnan was born in Charleston in 1927. He says his desire to be like his brother led to his interest in playing the clarinet. My older brother, Sid, had a dance band that used to play around town. They would practice at our house in the living room, and on weekends when they had jobs, they would all go to the job on the back of an open truck and with the instruments and the musicians. I think I would run down the street after them, hoping that I could hitch a ride and hear the band. Drasnin's resume includes stints with classic combos and big band leaders like Red Norvo, Tommy Dorsey, and Les Brown. In the 1950s, he found work as a studio musician and arranger. Then in 1959, Drasnin released his album entitled Voodoo, which is a classic in the exotica genre. Exotica is sort of a strange mixture of genres. It's Afro-Cuban, it's Polynesian, it's Hawaiian, it's exotic. It's not Stravinsky and it's not Charlie Parker but it's music that does go well with cool tropical drinks and thoughts of faraway places. Drasnin arranged and composed music for numerous made-for-TV movies and television series like Mission Impossible. Drasnin says he really enjoyed scoring the Wild Wild West. A takeoff on James Bond, and it was a delightful show. The scripts were good, the acting was good, and it was fun to write. So I really enjoyed writing that show. In the 1990s, Drasnin began recording and touring with jazz composer and guitarist Skip Heller. Having spent a whole career behind the scenes, so to speak, writing film scores, or playing in a big band where you're one of five saxophone players. Suddenly being in front of a group, playing your own music, and having the crowd go wild is pretty heady stuff for an 80-year-old guy. Hip, hip, hooray! Right now, here's Mr. Red Savant. You'll find me hanging around. It's there I'll be found, down on the corner of love. Red Sovine was born Woodrow Wilson Sovine in Charleston in 1918. He was best known for his sentimental talking songs like Truck Driver's Prayer and Teddy Bear. The old CB was blaring away on Channel 19. 
when there came a little boy's voice on the radio line. And he said, Breaker one nine, is anyone there? Come on back, truckers, and talk to Teddy Bear. Before getting his start in the music industry, Sovine worked at a mill in Putnam County. He was the superintendent of a hosiery mill in Eleanor, West Virginia. They were getting ready to close that mill down, and he had a choice of going to run a mill in Canada or play music. Sovine's first number one hit came in 1956 with Why Baby Why. I can't help but love you till the day that I die. So tell me why, baby, why, baby, why, baby, why? We got rich, we got poor. You live between your hits, you know. My dad never cared about having a million seller. He wanted a record that got played on the radio. Because if it got played on the radio, then people would want to book him to come play that beer joint or that schoolhouse or that auditorium. He wasn't in it to sell a million records. He was in it to go make money playing live music. The highways that wind and wander over mountains and valleys and deserts and plains. I guess I drove about all of them. It was in the 1970s that Sovine had his greatest successes with trucker-themed songs like Giddy Up Go and Phantom 309. By then he was a member and regular of the Grand Old Opry and an artist with Decca Records. I was going through the beautiful ballads and gorgeous love songs, just the prettiest voice. He had a real high voice as a young man and then it mellowed and mellowed and mellowed till it got to where it was toward the end of his life. When the sun goes down and the moon comes round, I'll be down on the corner of love. Red Sovine died of a heart attack in 67-year-old Charlie McCoy is the youngest in this year's class of inductees into the West Virginia Music Hall of Fame. I wish my mama were around because she would be so proud, you know. Uh, I was born up around Fayette County and uh, left there at an early age, but came back every summer and uh, I really love it here. I've been down to Whitewater five times and to be recognized by your own state is really special. McCoy says he has always felt a connection to the home of his childhood. I remember when I was a kid, of course, you know, we didn't have air conditioning, so in the summer you sleep with your windows up, and uh, we were, as the crow flies, a quarter of a mile from the drop into the gorge. And the trains would come up the gorge late at night. When they passed Fat Station, they would always blow the whistle. If you hear the whistle coming out of the gorge, it had an eerie echo sound to it. And that just really stuck with me. McCoy is known as the king of country harmonica, but he also plays guitar, keyboard, vibraphone, trumpet, saxophone, and tuba. He's released 34 of his own albums and recorded or performed live with Elvis Presley, Roy Orbison, Bob Dylan, George Jones, the list goes on and on. His love of music started with the harmonica, and it started here. 1949, I saw an ad in a comic book, you two can play harmonica in seven days or your money back. Send 50 cents in a box top. I begged my mother for 50 cents, and she said, you want to buy what? <laughs> this harmonica came, and... Uh, for the first week, I went around the house making noise. And then uh, when I was 16, I heard a record by Jimmy Reed. And when I heard the harmonica on that record, it just clicked. I said, hey, wait a minute. I have a harmonica. I need to learn to do that. The harmonica can produce the most haunting, sad sounds, and yet, at the same time, it can be the most joyous of instruments. It almost 
emulates the human voice better than most other instruments. When I came to Nashville, there was really nobody doing it. I mean, you know, timing is everything. My timing couldn't have been better. It's been a long and successful career for McCoy. Two decades as music director of the TV show Hee Haw, a Grammy Award, seven from the Academy of Country Music, two from the Country Music Association, induction into the International Musicians Hall of Fame. And I would say tonight is going to rank right up there with it. And that's your outlook. I'm Suzanne Higgins. Thanks for watching. Have a good evening.